All right, here we go. This is Cheshire Impact's webinar on lead scoring and grading. It's all about two-dimensional lead rating. Is that lead worth talking to or not? And we can get in a lot of trouble on the marketing side if we inadvertently say a lead is awesome when it's not. Uh, we can get a lot of trouble. And guess what that does? Not so much the trouble, but then sales might be a little bit slower on calling the next lead and the next one, the next one. And maybe there's a hot one in there. We really want them to just ping that person real quick. But if we've messed up our scoring and our grading, we're not really doing a good job of helping them prioritize. So done right, this makes you sales' best friend. Um, done wrong, eh, it's pretty messy. So this is going to be all about love because you know what? Lead scoring and grading, they go best together. Do you have any examples? Throw them in the, in the, in the Zoom chat. Any examples of things that go really well together? In, you know, go ahead, just throw it in the chat. This is all about things that are paired. And I got to tell you, lead scoring and grading have to be together. There's no such thing as a lead scoring webinar. That would be heresy. Or a grading webinar, that would be a travesty, okay? They got to go together. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here today. All right, today's plan. Let's do this. First of all, we're going to talk about the CSI question. If you don't already know what the CSI is, it's the Cheshire Success Index. It's a roadmap for Pardot. So the idea is don't automatically go from, I got a new Pardot account and I want to set up multi-touch tracking because you don't really have any touches to track just yet. There's a first, second, third step. There's actually a 10-step roadmap. So we're going to talk about that because today's webinar is all about a particular step on that roadmap, lead rating and scoring. Okay, so we're going to talk about how this fits into the whole big picture. Then we're going to get into how to totally crush your scoring. Okay, how to crush it, the conversations to avoid, and the tech that goes along with it. How to do that. Now, we will have some Pardot examples. If you don't have Pardot, try to imagine what life will be like with Pardot and then go get it. <laughs> and if you can't, um, you can try to see if you can customize what you have to, to fit into that. But if you have Pardot, all these things are built in and apparent. And the cool thing is Pardot is really the only platform that out of the box has scoring and grading. Other tools, you kind of have to modify, make some custom variables, but it, you can, it, can, it can happen. So we will have fun with that. Um, two examples I have, gin and tonic. Here, here, uh, free gin and tonics for everyone in the room. Uh, they're in the back. Uh, I also see peanut butter and jelly from New York. Fantastic. What kind of jelly, though? That's the real question. So, yeah, a lot of things go well together. Uh, winner, Lauren, uh, last name anonymous, wine and Zoom meetings. Fantastic. Um, and you think this is water, right? Absolutely. So <laughs> there's a lot of these pairs that go together. We're going to talk about that today. The thing is, when you go solo, it gets nasty with scoring and grading, and we're going to talk about it. And then after we've scared everyone, we're going to talk about combining grading and scoring together. And then finally, the best way to do grading strategies, a little bit of chat about the future, and then Q&A. And how Q&A works here for these webinars, I will stay as long as you want. If you want to do 24-hour Q&A, I'm here for you. Let's do this. Um, and so longer extended questions, we're capping the Q&A, those tend to go beyond the one hour hard stop. So if you've got a hard stop or those listening, um, we do turn off the recording for the extended Q&A, but if there's any questions asked throughout, you'll be able to pick those up. Cool. All right, we got some resources at the end too. So for those of you, every slide is another sip of your gin and tonic or your wine and your Zoom meeting. Uh, fantastic. Or your Coke Zero. Whatever is your pleasure. Now, let me introduce you to some best friends. That's my wife, Tina, and a couple numbers to introduce you to me by on the right-hand side. Number 11, that is the number of years I've been working with Pardot. And wouldn't you know that number at the bottom 11 is actually how many years we've been married, and it's actually a little bit beyond there. So Tina knew me before I knew Pardot, so I guess... She was my true love, and then Pardot is my second love, but I do love both. Um, not equally, not equally, Tina. Um, <laughs> and 2,500, that's the number of Pardot implementations that Cheshire Impact has done, uh, round about there. We kind of round to the nearest 100 now um, because there's been a lot. And I don't say that to brag. That really is just to share that there's been a lot of experience working with Pardot, myself with you know, 11 years, and then all those cases. This is from lessons learned across the board. I'll share some stories of me being in a boardroom, doing things wrong with scoring and not knowing any better, as well as doing things right and how it all works together. So that's us. That's me on Twitter. If you want to um, follow me and say hi, whatnot, Cheshire Impact, we're putting this webinar on. More on us later, though. I don't know if you've ever been to a webinar where they're like, me, 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 me. 
right? That's not what we're here to do today. So let's get on with the show. All right. Who has played this game? And I know it kind of dates you, how old you are, and it kind of puts you in a particular zone, I think. Though I will say my dad has become a pretty good video game guy in his, in his retirement days. He's also learning quantum physics. But this is called The Sims. Has anyone played this? Okay. Go ahead. Raise your hand if you've played The Sims. Got to, got to show me the love here. I need to see the two or three or 12 people that have played this game. Have you played this game? And if you haven't heard of it, let me know too in the Zoom so I can explain even more about it. But this is a fun game. And what this is, is you have the little person. You can kind of design them. You can decide where they go to work and what they do and their name. Now they have needs, right? They have hunger needs. They have fun needs. They have social needs. But when you go and chat with someone else and you can like click on a person, click another person and go, hey, talk to that person, right? Looks like our character here is talking to this nice lady over here and we're saying, we're just chit chatting. Now, you have options. When you click on your, your person, there's a spin wheel that says talk, it says joke. And uh, now it depends on how funny you are. Um, and then there's another thing. It's, sometimes it'll say tickle, right? Um, or, or like wrestle. Now, I got to tell you, if you just met someone off the, off the Sim Street here, or let's say you're out and about and the different locations you've been telling me about, Burlington and Tennessee and Boston and New Hampshire and all these places, you go outside Probably not now. We're all quarantined, right? But when this all thing breaks, if you go out, if you go to a bar or restaurant and you randomly walk up to someone and tickle them, is that going to be a good or bad experience? It's going to be a bad experience, right? Like, my goodness. Well, the whole point is in this game, if you try that with someone who doesn't know you, it's a bad experience on the game too. So it's kind of realistic in that regard. There's an order to the chaos, right? You meet someone, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking quite a bit. You're joking quite a bit. You're probably not tickling for a long time, if ever. Maybe joking, probably not wrestling, right? There's a progression to this thing. If you do it out of order, it doesn't work. The same thing happens with marketing automation. Thankfully, no one's trying to tackle you or tickle you. But here's the example. This person is trying to give someone a gift. But I just met you. I don't really want your – maybe, though, the gift worked, but something else didn't work. And, and they're stomping on it. I don't know. But they didn't follow the order. I found this was the case with marketing automation. Um, I mentioned the example at the very beginning where you are like, hey, I want to do this really advanced thing like advanced dynamic content. Who wants to do advanced dynamic content? That is the, one of the coolest features about Pardot. A good 80% of people buy Pardot for that same reason. But they don't necessarily always use it right away because there's a lot of steps, right? You got to have your list figured out. Who am I actually segmenting? You got to have some cookies happening, some action. You got to have some content to be able to do all this sort of thing. So there's a lot of steps you got to take before you get to advanced dynamic content. Same thing with multi-touch tracking. So we took a step back, realized this was the case, and created this thing called the CSI. I mean, that acronym was way too good to pass up, right? So the CSI is the Cheshire Success Index. It's all about marketing automation. Doesn't matter what platform you have. What this thing is, it's a combination of a roadmap and an assessment because there's 10 steps. And, and how we do this is um, we get on a, a phone call. So you, you get on a phone call with me and it takes about 25 minutes. It's, it's, con it's a conversation. And myself or someone on my team would ask you a series of questions, 10 questions. They've got all these different follow-up questions. And it's all about the different ways you're using Pardot. Hey, are you, are you using this? Are you using that? Are you using this? And what ends up happening at the end of that conversation of doing the CSI, you have three things. You know where you're at, you know your next step. You also know what a 10 looks like because that's the max score, 0 to 10. And you can see on this next slide here, this is what it looks like. There's different phases too. Segmentation is the very first thing. You got to know who your audience is. You got to set up ROI tracking. You got to get your data straight, straight and squared away. Then comes some gated content. Then creating nurture campaigns. Multiple ones too. Finally, on phase three, that's where we're at with this webinar. By the way, if you're realizing, oh my gosh, I haven't done a thousand things in all the previous phases, that's okay. It's totally fine. Learn this concept because even knowing it will help for when it, come, when it comes time to roll this thing out, or maybe it is time to roll it out and you're there on that step. Doing the CSI with us, that gives you a good sense for where you're at. By the way, it's free. Um, oh, another thing. If you do want to do that CSI conversation, 
um, with our team over at Chesh. It's free. We get on the phone call 25 minutes and you'll have a number between zero and 10, right? If you want to do that, all you got to do either in the Q and a menu or the chat menu, just type CSI. We'll pick that up with our secret squirrel, you know, lenses. We'll latch onto that and then we'll schedule some time with you offline. So that's all you got to do. Just type in CSI. Um, or send me an email at Casey at CheshireImpact.com and say CSI. And we'll do a quick conversation, find out where you sit in the chart. And the cool thing is you'll know your next step because your next step is the lowest number here that is incomplete, right? So the reason I'm spending some time on this, and I'm sorry if it sounds like an infomercial, but I really want everyone to know their CSI because then you know, okay, cool. Hey, I'm a four, right? I'm a two, I'm an eight, whatever you are, but you know what your next step is. And it's a lot better feeling than what I used to have when I was a marketer going, I think I'm using some of it. I feel like I could use more of it, but I don't really know how much I'm using. So CSI gives you that sort of foundation. So you're not just going after any kind of feature. The worst thing I saw was a blog post from another consultant who said, here are the eight most unused features of Pardot you should go check out. Hmm. Now are they unused because you can't find them? Are they unused because maybe you shouldn't be using them yet? I, that stuff just drives me crazy, right? There's some stuff we got to do early on. And the cool thing is if you do phase one fully, by the time you get to phase two, you're like, oh, this is actually easy. Your, your, your content will just come out of nowhere and your nurtures will come out of nowhere. It's very easy when you've done the stuff beforehand. So I'm just trying to make it a lot easier for people to do that. Anyways, that's the CSI. So cool. You either email me, Casey at Cheshire Impact. You throw it in the webinar chat or a Q and A if you want it to be private and we'll reach out and we'll schedule CSI. The reason I bring this up is because each one of the questions, each one of the steps on the CSI is a question. And this gives you a, it's like a focus, right? It gives you a focus to say, am I doing this or not? And for today's webinar, CSI number seven, two dimensional lead rating. The question on the assessment is, do you separately rate and answer this in the chat too? Chat, Q and A, whatever you want to do, smoke signals, or you can text me on the telegram. Um, send me a, send me a, <laughs> send me a telegraph. Um, do you separately rate your leads for their activity and their quality? So go ahead and answer that in the zoom webinar chat. Are you doing that? And if you're only doing one, and by the way, you could, you could use different words too. Are you using scoring or using grading? Are you actively doing scoring? Are you actively using grading? Where are you at? Giving me that kind of feedback lets me know who I'm talking to and where I can tailor some things. I see scoring. Yes. I see grading. Rah! Um, not activity scoring, uh, doing scoring, no grading. Good to see, right? All these things. The good news is at the end of this, my goal is for you to, you may not be able to answer this yes because you haven't built it yet in Pardot, but you'll be able to go, okay, I see what I, see what I need to do. I see what the pitfalls are. And if you want to go build it, you can go build it and it's not going to take you much time at all. I'll just see what we got here. I see both, but it could be improved. Yeah, absolutely. Hope to give you some great advanced tips in this as well. We aren't live with Pardot yet, but when we will, we'll be doing scoring grading. Hell yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so let's get on with it. Oh, peanut butter and jelly. Who mentioned that? Someone mentioned that earlier. That's fantastic. You called it. The only question is, what kind of jelly? What kind of jelly indeed? Um, I had some cherry jelly today. It was pretty cool. All right, scoring best practices. Let's talk about it. How are we doing with time? Plenty ish. Okay, first tip on scoring and how to rock your scoring is first of all, avoid getting in the weeds with sales on scoring. And in one of the stories that I actually experienced, unfortunately, I was a young marketer, a wee young lad, uh, marketing manager, I think. I wasn't coordinator, marketing manager, but I was pretty low on the totem pole. And I was in a boardroom with fancy table. Uh, head of marketing, head of sales, a sales rep or two, a marketer or two, a lot of people, right? This company invested a lot of people in this meeting, time too. And I was not talking because there were people above me talking and they were, they were debating the value to give a page visit and the value to give a click and a form field. And we went through the list mer mercilessly uh, like, oh, well, it, people were like hotly debating this. Well, no, a, a click should clearly be five points. That's a, that's a little too much. I think two points is more adequate, but can we go decimals? Does anyone know if we can go decimals on the system, right? These are kind of things were happening at the time. I had no idea what's going on. So I didn't know any better, but I got to tell you, you don't need to do that. 
Because when it comes down to it, even though they call it lead scoring, and historically speaking, lead scoring was something that sales looked at. But it's a terrible thing for sales to look at. When you have scoring and grading, they're primarily going to be concerned with the grade when you have both. In the past, there was just one number. It's a terrible number. It doesn't make any sense. And so sales really cares about it sometimes. Sometimes they don't even look at it anymore because the number can get unwieldy and they don't even know what it means. But avoid getting in the weeds with them because it's actually a marketing device. What I mean by that is primarily the use of score for you is just to see how engaged your prospects are so that when they get to a certain threshold, you're going to be like, okay, let's send them over to sales to see if there's anything brewing here, right? You're going to use it to kind of, rather than just opening the floodgates, I know sometimes what we do is we just, you fill out a form, you go right to sales, right? But what does sales say? Well, if, if they're vocal, they'll say, I don't want to call someone just because they got downloaded your white paper. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But I've even had conversations lately where they're saying, well, they registered for a webinar, but did they attend it? I'm like, we've got a lot of people to talk to. Like, you know, can we even reach out to all these people? Do we even want to? They're trying to prioritize their time. So I don't knock sales at all. They're, they're giving us the feedback saying, look, I get it. You've sent me 80 leads this week, but you know, only four of them are actually leads. These other people are engaging, but they're not, none of them are ready yet. Totally cool. That's why we don't need to get, tell them too much about scoring. All I like to tell sales is, look, with score, we're measuring engagement, their actions they're taking. So what you're going to see is the higher the number, the more actions they've taken. That's it. And on the marketing side, we can adjust the score as we see fit. But don't involve uh, sales into like getting in the weeds and what it actually means. Cool. And we're going to progress through these, this jungle here. Now, now that I've said, don't get sales involved in modifying the score. What about marketing modifying the score? Well, in the words of the violent Batman down below, don't smack Robin, Batman. But um, Robin is saying, you know, clicks should be two and not three points. Now, whether Robin's on your marketing team with you or on your sales team, we don't condone um, physical smacking here, but you get the point. You don't need to change it. And I can actually count, and you can see it on here, a number of times the score was actually needed to change. The cool thing is Pardot scoring setup is actually really good. It's actually really good. And you're gonna, you're gonna see why as we progress more and talk more about how to do scoring the right way. The default scoring is really good. There's only a couple things I like to change on there. Um, uh, not, actually, not even that. There's only one thing you could change, which is around webinar attendance. I think right now, a webinar attendance by default is zero. Uh, and sometimes I'll, I'll bump that up to an extra 50. So you get 50 for signing up, 50 for attending. But honestly, attending a webinar might even get even more points. But that's the only thing, just around webinar attendance. If you've got a plug-in tied in there, um, that's one of the things you can, you can modify. Otherwise, the scoring is really good. So don't get wrapped up around it. Here's a default scoring in Pardot. As you can see, there is three points for a redirect click, three points for file access, negative five for form error. You know, in general, I don't like taking score away from people because it, it, it signifies their actions they've taken. Now, in the, old, in the old world or in the old days or in the old methodology, if you're just using lead score, by the way, salespeople hate it because they have no idea what it means because it's a huge number between 4,000 and 20. Um, they have no idea what it means, but oftentimes when it was combined, they would look at this unwieldy number and they're like, I don't know what it means. But in a purest sense, when we're doing lead scoring the right way, when you have grading involved, you know grading's coming. So we're going to just assume that doing it the right way involves having grading. We know that this just measures engagement. So I don't think there's any need to deduct points from people because they're just engaging. Now, there's a couple of things you'll see on here. If people have an error filling out a form. We tend to deduct points. Uh, you know, it's like the idiot, idiot law. I guess, you know, you didn't quite get that right, so we're going to deduct points. A lot of that was for if you've got like a computer automated system that's like filling out forms over and over again, you want to deduct points. But typically, I don't know. I mean, but, but again, I don't really change it because I don't really sweat it too much, and you'll see why as we keep going. Now, you'll also see that, you know, opportunity lost, negative 100 points. I don't like doing that either because they still were engaged. However much they were or weren't engaged, they were still engaged. 
Uh, but other than those, those minuses, sometimes you'll see if someone visits a career page, deduct 50 points. Um, am I okay with that? Sometimes because when, with that, it might be keeping them from going over to sales right away. And maybe I want that to happen. Maybe someone came to the site, they're looking actually for a job and they're not actually looking to be a lead. They're going to the career page. I might want to slow things down on them. And that's really what deducting score will do. It just slows things down on people. It's going to be a little bit longer for them. They're going to have to do a little more action before they go over to sales. So in that regard, deducting's not too bad, but just keep in mind what it actually does. It's just slowing the thing down a little bit. But once it's sent over to sales, it's just a, it's a, it's just a number. It's not as important nearly as grading. All right, well, how do we edit though? Like if you did want to edit things like the way I talked about, maybe not event registered, but if you want to do like event attended, somebody actually came to your event, you want to bump up 50 points, you just hit edit, change the scoring rule, magic. And that, what you'll see is down below, if you change anything, it'll let you know if anything's going to be triggered by this. Like, okay, you've got an automation rule that assigns to the sales team. If you change this, it changes it for everyone. And that's a huge point to make. In Pardot, it's retroactive. So if you change how scoring is done, the good news is you, it'll automatically change the, the past. So however many points people got for doing a link click, don't change those. Let's say uh, the webinar attendees, you change that, you give them an extra 50 points. Everyone in the dawn of time in your whole part of the account will get that increase in their score. Just keep that in mind because if you affect, in this case, 207 prospects with your change, that may accidentally or purposely send a 207 prospects over to the sales team right now after the, after the rule changes. So just be careful with any kind of changes to scoring um, early on or just ever. Just keep in mind that, you know, it could trigger a bunch of stuff down the line. All right. There's also, because we're going to get a little bit into part out, right? We're talking, and I'm going to get into um, more of like what points to set for different kind of people in a second. But I just want to kind of show you a little bit about part out too as we're going through this. And um, scoring categories. Does anyone have scoring categories set up in their, in, their, um, in their account? Just throw it in the chat. Do you even have it in your account? Um, scoring categories come with a certain level of part out, depending on if you have it or not. Um, and if you have them, um, available, you can certainly set them up. I would though, I would set them up after grading is complete, right? So the, the order and progression would be, you got regular scoring, you got grading, that thing is cooking. Now you go and you set up categories. Categories is just an extra layer. Um, it helps separate out the score into multiple categories. And what would the use case be? It would be something like, okay, we've got multiple products or Cheshire Impact, for example. We do part up and we do Salesforce. Nobody seems to remember that we do Salesforce too because we talk about Pardot all the time. It's probably my fault. But uh, we do Salesforce all the time and Pardot all the time. If you come to our website, there's different pages for the different topics. If you do a lot of research, if you get a lot of white papers, webinars, all about Pardot, you can take all that content, put it in a particular folder. You can see down below, assigned to a folder. Put a particular folder called Pardot resources. You can take all your Salesforce resources, put them in another folder, Hit go, set it up here. And what it's going to do is as people consume content from different categories, it's going to keep track. So this is helpful for sales because it can indicate to them what kind of needs the customer may have, right? So you come to our website, you're all over that Salesforce category. You know, if we're reaching out to you, we probably could be looking at that going, so, you know, hey, how can we help you? Are you looking for any Salesforce help? right? Can we help change some reports for you? Hey, let's do it, right? As opposed to being completely in the blind. And there, it's not only is it helpful for sales, but it's helpful to get sales to call, right? It's all about that. How fast can we get them to make a contact? It's motivation. If they see a score, a grade, and they see, oh, and they're interested in product A, because you can do this with products too. Product A, product B, product C, you can do that kind of thing. So now they even don't even have to ask. They know where you're at. And later on, you can even trigger automation rules. You can put nurtures to happen based on this. So it's really cool stuff. Just keep in mind, we got to get actual scoring and grading rocking and rolling. And then we want to roll out scoring categories after that. But it's actually really cool. All right. Here is my favorite slide. As simple as it is, and the terminology is so simple, but sometimes simple is like powerful, right? Complexity is the enemy of execution. 
And it's so true time after time. So just keeping it simple can really help us actually get stuff done. Because how many times do you come off a Marketo account and it's like not implemented after a year because there's so much doing, it's complicated. You're like, I don't even know. Everything's a campaign, right? Well, we try to keep things simple here. So when it comes to scoring, how many points should we give something? And it's, it's amazing because Pardot, their default actually follows this, this pattern, this, this rule and this schooling. Big score, little score. That's the thing to think about. If you want to change the words when you're talking internally, when you're talking to CEO, big score, if you want to, like large score, little score, right? But really big score, little score is how we're going to look at things. Scoring is just going to be the thing that indicates your engagement. And we want to have a certain amount of engagement before a threshold hits and we send you to sales, right? So there's a couple things to think about here. The score you get should be re um, relative to the, the amount of effort you took to do that action, right? It's all about actions here. We're not gonna put how good of a lead you are or anything like that. It was actions you took. So what's a good example of a little score? Uh, a little score was a web page visit. You visited a web page and you clicked into through it and you just, your eyes observed the light coming off your laptop. You didn't do anything else. You just, you're breathing and alive, but you didn't spend any effort to do that, okay? So um, a lot of cases, zero is fine. One is fine if you want to do that for every page. Cool. Clicking a link, clicking a link a little bit more than having your eyes just look at something. Your little finger had you know, maybe three or four, 9,000 muscles in here, all moving to click that. Okay, right? You get it, right? It's a little tiny click. Took none of your time, none of your effort. I might give you a point, three points. Don't really care, but it's in that one to five range because, hey, it's little scores, right? Big scores, on the other hand, are primarily your forms. Completing a form, and hopefully they're not terrible. We have another webinar on like form optimization and landing page optimization. It's really cool. But the idea is to make your form as short as it can be so where you're getting a lot of people converting, but you still get the information you need. And there's cool tactics and techniques for that. But your forms, unfortunately, are a little bit of a friction point, right? You're asking them questions like one, two, three, four, or more questions, they gotta use their brains, they gotta type with their fingers, lots of muscles are being used, right? And it's kind of a barter, they're like, okay, do I wanna give you my email? You'll probably email me. Do I give you my phone number? You're probably gonna call me, right? All those kind of things. So they're really thinking, is it worth your white paper? And if it is, they hit go. That gets 50 points. 50 points is essentially a big score. Now, do I care if it's 50 points and big score and the little score is like, one or two or three. You don't have to email me. You can make it whatever you want within those kind of ranges. You can make it 500 points for a big score and 10 points for a little score. You can add zeros all day if you want. Doesn't matter. The cool thing is, as long as you preserve the ratio between big and little. So the, the two ratios to think about are how much effort did it take to take this action? Now, attending a webinar is a, is a lot of action. Watching a whole hour long video, that's a lot of, that's a that's a dedicated engagement, right? That engagement took time. I'd much rather give more score to doing something like that where they spend an, an hour of their time watching your webinar or engaging with you versus giving them a few points here or there for some little action, right? So look at the little line chart that I drew with PowerPoint, like pen, okay? This is important. This is essentially what happens. And it looks just as goofy okay they, they meet you they may do a couple actions blah, 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 little tiny things right little scores are happening clicking stuff looking at web pages don't care but you know what it is helpful to have little score there because it keeps it moving and it shows you relatively how things are growing right give them a little points that's totally fine little score is helpful because because it could add up right if you do look at every single page on the whole site that could add up. But what I don't want to have happen between big and little score is you just do a bunch of little score things and then you get sent to sales, right? Because that's not really engagement. Sometimes they don't even think getting your white papers engagement. So are they going to really like see someone, all they did was look at your website? No. So little score has to be in a ratio to big score where it, you can, it takes a whole heck of a lot of little scores to get to big, right? So if this one's 50 and that one's one or two or three, it's going to take 50 or 20 or 25 or whatever. It's going to take a lot of those actions. Your 25 web pages, you know, or 50 web pages to get to that, you probably, it's probably not going to happen, right? So that way you can protect yourself from inadvertently sending someone to sales when they hit your threshold for doing a bunch of little things, okay? So the, this particular red line, they're doing a couple little things. Boom, they filled out a form. 
Now their score jumped a bit, but that was just one thing. Maybe it was a fluke. They just filled out one form. So maybe they got nurtured. Maybe they went around the site some more, looked at some more web pages, and then what else happened? Boom, second form. Second form gets filled out. Now they're above the threshold. They may, the score may continue to go, and that's totally fine, but that threshold was hit, and now I'm going to send them over to sales. My automation rules inside of Pardot are saying, if the score is 100 or greater, send them over to sales, right? And that's your mechanism. Now you can raise and lower this threshold, but you know that the logic is sane and sound. So you could make your threshold 150 points, and you would know that roughly equals three big scores, right? Or two big scores and attending a webinar, actually attending the thing. And that gets points too? Cool. That's 150 points. And marketing and sales can work together on raising and lowering the threshold. They don't necessarily need to know what the threshold is. They don't need to understand the mechanism. But if they're saying, I'd like less leads, like a little bit higher quality, a little bit more engaged people, you can raise that up a little bit. If they're like, I like a little more people coming in for me to call. I'm getting bored. You can lower it a little bit. And that'll, that'll control the, the flow. It's like water through the dam kind of thing. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Just throw them in the Zoom webinar chat. I just want to make sure you're, you're good with this, right? Big score, little score, that's the thing to, to um, protect. And the good news is this is how Pardot score back in here when we looked at it. This is how it's set up. I'm looking at it real quick right now. Right, 50 points and you know, one and three, right? One point page view, three point cut, you know, a click. Email open gets zero because they may not have actually done anything. They just may have killed the other email in their inbox and it automatically opened this email. But if they do an email click, we'll give that some score because they clicked a little finger, right? And if they sign up for a webinar, that's a barter. They're giving us more information. And naturally, if they attend a webinar, I like to give them extra, I like to give them credit for that. So big score, little score. All right. Scoring alone breaks everything. I could probably put this section earlier just to scare everyone. But now that we've talked about scoring and we're like, oh, cool, it's all about what's going on. Let's talk a little bit more about why scoring breaks everything. Um, real quick fun story. Fallujah, I was in Iraq with my buddies. That's my friend Ben here. He's actually a really nice guy, but that was his war face, right? This was right before we are supposed to go on our first mission, which, by the way, got postponed. Um, but we're like, oh, let's do this. Back to go on our mission. Um, Ben's actually a really nice guy, but that's a good war face. But the reason I bring this thing up is because when you're driving in Iraq um, at night, you don't have your headlights on because that's like, a, hey, come look at me. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a car, and maybe you can come attack me. So instead, you turn off all the lights, and there's no street lights, so it, sometimes it can be pitch black. So you have to drive with NVGs on night vision goggles. The problem is they take, they take um, one picture from the outside land and they put it to your two eyes but your two eyes are just looking at the same picture so wh what it essentially does is it gets rid of your two eyes makes them one and they see the same thing it gets rid of your depth perception it makes things two-dimensional instead of three now you can infer as i can that this looks like it's a it's a road that's going down this path but it doesn't have that feel like if you look up from your monitor and you're like okay that tv is far away this thing isn't you don't have that feel well the reason i bring this thing up um, I may or may not have run into uh, uh, a hill, but I, <laughs> I didn't run into a building. Um, but it's, it can be hard to drive like this, right? It can be really challenging um, at night and kind of hilarious. There's funny stories to share. Um, I'll be at the bar after. So um, the reason I bring this thing up is because this kind of environment is what we can be giving to sales. We could be putting NVGs on them and asking them to handle the leads we're sending them, and they're going to revert to their own tactics. So here's a quick quiz. Participate because your engagement will ensure the success of the world. Uh, lead score quiz number one. Who do you call first? And you will be scored and judged, and um, I will keep the track of these, um, these scores forever. So you must answer. If you don't answer, I don't know. It's, it's tough. Um, nope, Jennifer, you can't ask questions. You can only answer it. Um, I know. I would be asking who depends, too. Who is the better? I like that. Good answer, though, actually. Who is the better grade? Ah, oh, but in this case, we only have a score. So you just got to go with it. Who do you call first? Prospect A or Prospect B? Josh says, not enough info. And you're right. And everyone else saying, A, I appreciate you playing along. If you only have score, who do you call? Prospect A, right? It's like a pinata. Problem is, I want to introduce you to Prospect A. Prospect A is Sammy. She's a New York uh, 
university undergrad and uh, oh, actually it's a he. Uh, he's an undergrad and he and his friends are doing a class project uh, on your industry and they're enjoying it and they've downloaded everything you have. They filled out all of your forms and it was such a high score. I mean, you're used to like big score, little score, right? 100, 150, 200. So when you saw that 800, you ran over to sales and were like, drop everything and call Sammy. Sammy is going to make your quarter sales rep. And you're putting your reputation in the line, but you're excited. And guess what? You can't reach Sammy. Why? He's probably out at class or who knows what Sammy's doing, right? But let's say sales is diligent and they're like, oh, wow, marketing is excited about this. One. I'm going to call. I don't believe them, but I'm going to try it. Finally tracks him down. He's like, hey, man, I'm just doing a research project. Zero budget, not going to, and it's a waste of time, right? Long story short, you've wasted sales time with this. Now, there are other ways on that form to find out if someone's a student, right? Or looking for a job or something. There's some things we can do, but this just kind of illustrates that, you know, if you just look at the number, you don't have enough info. And everyone was saying that in the chat too. Um, and, and I love Craig's response, whichever one came first, speed to lead, baby. I totally agree. Speed to lead. And the way that we get that speed is we get rid of the chaff, right? Get rid of ones that we don't want sales to call right away so they can prioritize the ones that we want them to pounce on problem in this situation was prospect B for everyone who didn't choose prospect B by the way those of you who didn't choose anything you also failed because it's too late because um, apparently prospect B was an interesting executive and your competitors reached her first so while while our salesperson was chasing Sammy somebody else was chasing prospect B they got to her and uh, to Craig's point other people's points Oftentimes, and there's a stat around this, the first person to call you is often the one you're going to buy from. So speed to lead is important. If you get that first phone call in, and the reason is you can set mines and traps and you can, you can make – everyone else is on the defensive because you're the first person to call. So it's huge. It's important. And we lost because of it. All right. Quick lesson on sales. Always be closing. Uh, great movie. Has anyone seen this? Does anyone know what movie this is? If you know what movie this is, First one to put it in there wins the contest. What is the name of this movie? Coffee's for closures, but what's the name of the movie, Craig? What's the name of the movie? There it is. Craig's the winner. Craig, do you have a copy of the book? Do you have a copy of my book? If you don't, we'll get you a copy. Fantastic speed. Fantastic speed on there. This is from Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Sales should always be closing. Again, I mentioned this, I just kind of touched on this earlier. Sales are trying to prioritize their time. It's, it's a prioritization game. And one time I was doing sales, um, by the way, I recommend just trying sales out in some fashion if you're in marketing, because it gives you that eye-opening experience. And I, I had a chance to do this at bridal shows. I was quote unquote, a tuxedo model. And I, they would show up at a, at a bridal show and put on a tuxedo. And I would stand at a booth for the tuxedo rental company classic tuxedo and they would open the doors and all these brides to be would flood it has anyone been to a bridal show go ahead and like give me some love raise your hand or say do you have in the chat so i don't feel like the only guy that's been to 30 bridal shows but anyways they'd all come running in and then i would have clipboards and they'd come by and i'd say hey do you have do you have your tuxedo picked out yet does you know does he have it picked out if it was just her or they're both there together hey do you know what kind of tux you're gonna get right come on over guys and we would talk with them, but the whole goal was not to get them to buy tuxes on the spot. It was just to sign up a form, put a little deposit down, totally refundable, $10, just to come in the store and check it out. If they did that, they'd get like a free tuxedo and all this stuff. It was to try to like qualify the lead gen, to get them in. But I learned a lesson because there, there's one spot where someone would say no, and you'd be like, oh, okay, but here's what are your objections. And they're like, no, we're still, no, we're not going to do that. Like, oh, and you could spend a lot of, too much time on people that were just not ever going to buy. And it was a huge lesson for me when the CEO of the company was like, hey, Casey, you're spending a lot of time with people who have already told you they're not interested. You know, like you, you could do a better job of prioritizing who you're talking to. And if they're not interested, it's great. Wish them a happy wedding and, and get that next person and like find the next conversation and try to go after that. That's, that's sales in a nutshell, right? You want to talk to people who are the best fit for your time. And as a salesperson, you only have so much time and you want to get the people that want to buy from you in that time. That's what grading and scoring is to do, is here to do, right? So that's what we're trying to help them. And the reason I spend a little time on that is because 
it just gives you a good sense for who you're working with and why you're doing this in the first place. It's not because it's just part of cool technology. It's because it actually does help. If I had someone, if I had had a marketer um, at that trade show with me who, you know, magically was saying, hey, Casey, uh, here's an A coming in. I'd be like, oh, come on. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Casey, this is an F or this person is, um, you know, a D or a bad grade. And like, I might say hi and, and chat real quick, but move them on. Oh, this one's a C. Okay, I'll we'll give it a shot, but I'm going to prioritize the A's, right? So grading can make such a difference. I would have loved that at the trade show, but it felt like cheating. It would have been awesome. So that's what we do. That's what we can do in marketing is we can help those salespeople make use of that time, sell the tuxedos to people who want to get them. If you're going to get a suit, great. Well, actually they sold suits too, but if you, oh, you're just going to, you're going to go destination wedding with, uh, with shorts on. God bless have a great wedding, get to the next one, right? So that's what we're looking to do here. Grading makes everything better. Chocolate makes everything better, coffee does, bacon does. Is there anything on this list that I've left out? Throw it in the chat and I'll make sure I adjust the webinar to that. Beer makes everything better as well. And for those who find wine makes Zoom better, um, carry on. All right, let's talk about grading. This is how to do grading right. And so to be able to do that, let's talk, about now how they come together, what does what, okay? Scoring and grading, grading and scoring. I don't care which one you put first or second, as long as in, when you're talking about it, as long as you have them both together. Again, they're matched up, they're together. Let's talk about what they are. We've just spent a lot of time on scoring, but let's, let's review. Scoring is how interested they are in you. Grading you're gonna find is how interested you are in them. This is the sentence, right? So if there's one sentence to help sales out, um, it, to explain it to other marketers, to explain it to your boss, to explain to anyone. It's these two top bullets. Again, scoring. How interested they are in you. Sammy was really interested in you. How interested are you in him? Not interested. He's a student doing research. So his score might be high, but his grade might be low. And you need both of them together because it's like a mutual relationship. How interested are you in me? Very cool. Well, how interested am I in you? And that combination is the magic. So on the scoring side, now be, pause. In between scoring and grading, draw a mental wall, the Great Wall of China, uh, some other kind of wall. Build a wall in your backyard, a wall in a prison, <laughs> whatever kind of wall you want to put up. Scoring and grading. You shall not pass, says Gandalf. You cannot go in between these things. It'll get really messy and ineffective if you mess score, if you put some scoring things in the grading side and grading things in the scoring side. So when I say that now on the scoring side, activity and engagement, if people take an action, you have to regulate that. You have to keep track of that with a score. As cool as the action is, you cannot make that affect a grade. Um, hey, you all joined a webinar. You fantastic. I love you all amazing people. You know what? You guys are fantastic. I, I'm interested in you. So I want to make, nope, nope. It's an action, right? I cannot, just because you've attended the webinar, do anything with your grade. Because all I know from this activity so far is that you're interested in me. There's other questions that decide how interested I am in you. So just because a critical action's taken place, oh, they filled out a quote request. Um, they must be a hot lead, right? Cool. They're very engaged but that does not modify their grade. Don't violate this. Do it at your own peril, but that's the important part. That's where a lot of things happen. You may understand score, understand grade, but check your scoring and grading out. Have you let any of these things go on the other side? If you have, separate them back out to their own side. Scoring is going to be a number that increases. Grade is going to be a letter grade, A through F. Now, um, on grading, it's going to be the quality of the lead. It's like, Again, how interested you are in them. It's going to be your lead, your lead quality. It's going to be the desirability to sales. It's going to be the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. It's going to be those leads from Mitch and Murray, right? It's going to be puppies, Lauren. It's going to be the amazing things, right? And you're going to do it with a letter grade that continually goes up. And there was a question about the internet went down. Yeah, I've had that happen too, Christy. Uh, fingers crossed, knocking on the wall for this particular webinar. Yes, we are recording this and everyone will get a recording. And also all of these recordings go up on our website, CheshireImpact.com under resources, webinars. We have like 15 or 20 of these webinars. All the recordings are there for sure. And they will all increase your grade and they will not increase your score. Uh, 
uh, opposite. They will all increase your score, but they will not increase your grade. Um, so again, scoring is going to be marketing's mechanism. It's our number to figure out how engaged they are to send to sales. But then sales is primarily going to look at the grade. Oftentimes when I have them sort a lead, a list of their leads they own in Salesforce sales, I will have them sort first. On the, and if I'm doing the report, I'll do it. Sort first by grade, then by score. So what you end up with is a list of all the A's and then by relative engagement. So they can naturally call the most engaged A, then the second most engaged A. Then finally, the least engaged A is still better than the B, and then the C, and then the D. So we're going to talk more about how that works. But this is the slide. If you want to take a screenshot, get the recording, whatever, this is the one. They're better together. These are the things you want to keep them separate. Um, if someone takes an action, it doesn't increase their grade. If someone is an amazing person, that doesn't increase their score. Quick question. How do you get sales to buy into grading? First problem is they don't know their ideal customer with fields available and part out to grade on. Fantastic question. How do you get them to buy into grading is the first question. You, you use criteria that they want. And this kind of gets ahead to this next part. But you use criteria that they would use. Now, if the second problem is they don't know their ideal customer, there's some things that we can talk through here to help them out with that. Um, and so let me get to that in the, in the slides, but that's a fantastic question and um, hold me to that. If I don't address that with the next couple slides, hold me to that. I will make sure I address that because it's very important. So grading best practices. We know how they kind of fit together. Oh, by the way, Oreos, anyone hungry? Look at the Oreos. Look at the Oreos. Does anyone not have Oreos? Um, I think Amazon still has Oreos. Um, yum. Oreos. Oreos. Okay. Grading best practices. And I know we're getting kind of the end, so I, but I will spend as much time as I need to to make sure we get the grading best practices done. If I, in typical fashion, talk through the, the top of the hour and you got to bounce, all good because we've got a recording for you. All right? All good. Grading best practices. What do we got here? You need to know what your best lead is. And th this is a longer conversation, but who, what are the qualities of the best lead? And you see on here, I say, start by asking sales because this is their mechanism. The outcome we want at the end of the day, whether they know it right away or not, whether sales knows the best qualities or not, is that the outcome is they call an A and they go, yeah, that was awesome, right? That's who I want to talk to. If they call it an F, you never want to send them an F. They would go, oh, terrible. But if they call a B, they'd go, yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty good pretty good. Yeah, it's kind of far off, but it's pretty good. They call C, they go, yeah. Yeah, I think we can eventually get them, right? And it doesn't necessarily tie into the timeline per se, but like they call an A and they're like celebrating, right? That's the goal. And then if they see a list of eight A's, they're going to call them all right away because they want it. So to figure out what these qualities are and essentially the way the grading works in part out the flash forward is there's individual questions. So you're like, are they, are they, um, do they have a project timeline? Do they have, are they going to buy something right now? If yes, then increase their grade. If no, you can decrease it or just leave it the same. So we're going to have to have multiple questions, multiple qualities that, that make up their best lead. So this can be a challenge. Um, I have had some conversations where I had a room full of salespeople. I was training them how to use Pardot and I asked them, cause we don't set up grading just yet. They're just implementing. So we're like, hey, what's the best quality of a lead for you? We asked that question, and what, what answer do we get? Now, the sales manager prime, you know, like chimed in and said a bunch of craziness that I don't even remember to this day because it was terrible. It, like, it wasn't good. It was like fluff. You know, like, I don't know, like all dogs go to heaven. It didn't make any sense. But then some of his team chimed in and were like specific thing, specific thing, specific thing. And we kind of merged the two together. We had some additional conversations. But j I'm just saying this to sales leadership may know the answer or the sales team may know the answer or BDR may know some things too. I was once in a meeting. Uh, it was an on-site strategy on-site. Um, if you're in a warm tropical climate, I'd love to do a strategy on-site with you. If you're not, you can come visit our strategy on site down south. <laughs> um, I was in this big meeting. And we we're trying to figure out what would the grading criteria be. And I was kind of walking people through this. I'm happy to help walk your team through this as well. Um, help interface with sales and that kind of thing. Happy to do that. Um, and so we were talking with them and 
Sales didn't know. Sales leadership didn't know. Marketing didn't know. Marketing leadership didn't know. Nobody knew. I don't know because I'm the consultant. I'm here to try to help them. But somebody was smart and invited their BDR rep. They had a couple, but they had their uh, BDR would be like business development rep, also known as an SDR rep. Um, they've had different names. I heard one of them call them a, a CBD rep, but nowadays that's a totally different acronym. Um, but essentially it's like uh, the person that does the, the call or the vetting to see if the lead is good enough. In some organizations, they will vet them a little bit and then send them on. They kind of do their own grading um, uh, as BDRs. So somebody invited this BDR rep to the meeting and they all kind of looked at him and he's like, oh yeah. He goes, when I mention this, 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 or this, people always call me back if I leave that in the voicemail, right? So what he was getting at was there are a couple things, there are a couple either qualities about that person or there are a couple pain points that if he mentioned these things, they were like ready to play ball. And in this case, it was like IT project management. And if he mentioned audits or he mentioned um, acquisitions or certain things and people in the right shape, place or time, if any of these qualities were true, not only were they great leads, but they would like harass him back. And so he started sharing these things. So you never know who might have this information. If by the way, sales doesn't work, sales leadership doesn't work, and BDRs don't all necessarily know, you can always start with BANT. BANT, because really what we're doing in grading is we're not qualifying people because qualification in sales, there's a lot to that. So we're actually pre-qualifying people. We're just doing a little bit to help sales prioritize their time. So when in doubt, you can use something called BANT. Has anyone heard of BANT? If you have, throw down what one of the letters mean. If you haven't heard about it, you're about to hear about it, and it's fantastic. BANT is budget, authority, need. There you go. Budget, authority, need, and timeline. Yep, cool. Great job. So what that is, that's like, I don't want to say baby level. It's, it's kind of like um, one of the most widely used sales qualification processes that sales uses right? So sales, oftentimes sales managers, if they're talking to someone on their team, they'll say, okay, you just talked to Cheshire Impact. How, how are they as a potential customer? Do they have the budget? Have they already set aside budget to be able to pay for this? Uh, yes or no. Um, do they have authority? And authority means, are you talking to the right person? Are you talking to Casey Cheshire? Or are you talking to like the summer intern at this company who doesn't have any signing authority? Um, by the way, I once had a sales rep that had, um, like three meetings with people on my team and he canceled my meeting so he could talk to other people on the team. Clearly, I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. But come on sales. But A is all about authority. Who am I talking to is the person able to buy N is a need that was tying into that previous BDR. When he, when he said, Hey, if they have a need around audits or around acquisition or this other thing, they always, they, that's the need. That's a yes. And they're ready to play. And that was an instant one for him. Finally, T is timeline. Hey, do they have a project timeline? And guess what? All those questions I just asked you from Bant are questions you could ask in Pardot forms. Maybe not all of them in one. Maybe not all of them in even the first form. Maybe the first form is super short. They come back and get some other content. Use progressive profiling in Pardot. There's another webinar on that. Use progressive profiling in Pardot to ask a different question every time or a couple different ones. So by the time you send them over to sales, you've asked them B, A, N, and T. Maybe just A, N, and T. Sometimes budget can be a weird question. But if people say yes, well, you definitely want to call them. They have the budget. And you can use those as four questions that could certainly be asked in the form to say, do you have a timeline for this? And the answer might be, we have an immediate project or we're doing research for the next um, project in the next three months or project three to, three to nine months or a year plus in the future. That lets sales know how quickly they probably should be responding. And that can adjust their grade. And I, I mentioned this already. It's a Q&A style mechanism. So you say, okay, uh, let's say need. Do they have a need? If yes, increase their grade. If no, you can leave it flat or you can actually decrease their grade. But you need each one of these questions to keep upping it. You can't just have them answer one question or you look at their file and they have said a couple things right and you just have one rule that just bumps them to an A. No, it's a progressive thing. Everyone starts out as a D and then they increase. So look, I have a whole slide on it. There's, there's Bant right there for you. So everyone starts out as a D in Pardot, and it's not visible. So if, you're, if your grade has not been modified, it's a D, and it's invisible. And as soon as you've modified the grade, either down or up, dropped them down, dropped Sammy down to an F, 
And now you know, here's a great tip. Make it so that Fs never get sent over to sales. It can be a quality in there. If grade is, you know, the, it's the right score, you got their phone number, they're ready to go, all the things you need are in there, and their grade is not an F, send to sales. It's important to do that because it's all about presenting marketing in a good light, which is like, let's not send Fs, maybe not even Ds, maybe just A, Bs, and Cs. But here is banned for you. Okay, fit or not grading mechanism. We've hinted at this. Here's just a quick picture of it. I know we're getting to the top of the hour. In fact, we are at the top of the hour and I've run long, but we will continue. Um, and so if you need to grab the recording, absolutely do that. Otherwise, let's party. And for those of you who are doing wine or gin and Zoom, carry on. You may need a refill. I'll be here. So the grading is a fit or fold. It's a, it's a, do you fit or not? And you're going to set it up in Pardot over here. It's really weird to get to. You're not even going to know it's it. It's going to be home marketing segmentation profiles. And I see got to go, but thanks so much. I'll check out the recording. Totally cool. Totally cool. We'll see you on the recording. Absolutely. There's some good resources that'll be at the end. So you'll definitely want to check out the recording. All right. So you'll see right here, segmentation profiles. You'll only set up profiles once to be able to address this kind of stuff. You can have multiple profiles. So you can actually grade people according to who they are. Let's say we were selling um, two completely different things. Like let's say Cheshire Impact had an HR component to it where we help people. We were a job placement company and we were like a marketing services company and a Salesforce company, right? If you came and you were a, a prospect for the HR services or like recruiting, we probably want to talk to the head of recruiting or head of HR in your company. We want to talk to this person, that person. There's probably a different kind of grading scheme for that particular prospect group. Whereas you might, if you're going to do like, you know, people that are going to buy marketing services, maybe you want the senior level marketer at the company and that kind of thing. So to be able to have separate grading criteria, you have separate profiles you put people in. That's how that's done. But you notice in the profile, all you're setting up is some criteria name. It could be BANT, budget authority need timeline. One of the things I like to add as well is region because Pardot automatically identifies state and country, province and country as well if they're in Canada, which means you can automatically eliminate anyone that is in a country you don't service or can't service for whatever reason. And if they are in a country you can service, you can just automatically bump people's grade for being in the right place. So at least they get one tick to their, to their grade. Because remember, they have to get enough yeses to go from a D to an A. D gets a plus, they go to a C. Gets another plus, they go to a B. Gets another plus, now they go to an A. So you need to have at least three correct answers for people to be an A. If you only ask two grading questions, you'll only be ev able to ever serve. Um, or if you only have two, you'll only be able to give Bs to sales. That's terrible. We want to give them some A's, right? So you got to have a couple questions in there. So in case you didn't get some answered, but you got some other ones answered, it works. Now you set it up here, but the, the mechanism, this is just like a name and how much it counts. Note, you can actually change the letter grade by a third or by two thirds. You can go from a B minus to a B or oh, make this go from a B to a B plus. I recommend not doing that. Leave them all as ones because like I said before, you need to have enough questions answered to get people to an A. If you mess around with thirds of a, of a, of a grade, you may have some really dialed in C pluses and B minuses and Bs and sales will be unimpressed. So you wanna have some A's, some B's and some C's for simplicity purposes. All right, once in Pardot, you've done your profile, and of course you had to have that discovery at the end. That's the hard part. The part out part, that falls in place. But talking to sales, figuring out what's up, having those conversations to figure out what's the qualities for the grade, that's the hard part. Putting it in here, no big deal. What you do is once you have this criteria put in your profile, you create automation rules. And you're gonna want one for each one of the um, categories, one of each of the criteria. They're gonna need their own automation rule. How it works is you'll see something like, we're talking about country. Country contains United States, Canada, UK, Belgium, what's up, Australia, whatever you want. Or you could do the, you could do the inverse too. You could say, well, there's only, we like every country. We just, there's a few we can't work with. 
or, you know, the, the, the Asian countries are in the wrong time zone for our customer service team. So we can't service them right now. So you have the option, right? You can figure out who fits this list. I'd say it's Canada. And then down below, it's a little funky, right? It, there's no option in actions in Pardot that says like change grade. That would be really helpful because then I would go, yeah, change grade. Totally got it. No, it doesn't say that. It says change profile criteria. If you write anything down from this web, and I hope you've written a bunch of stuff down or you're going to just get the recording, but you might want to write down change profile criteria because I'll even be teaching classes and going like, okay, let's modify the grade now. And I'm like, well, where the heck is it in this drop down? Because this drop down, you, you probably all know, something like 15, 18 fields long. It's, it's huge. It's amazing. But you're like, oh, what's the grading thing again? You know, it's change profile criteria. So write that down. Default is the profile name. If you had the HR profile and the marketing services profile, you could do that. You don't, if they're just different industries, you don't need to change it. It's just that they're different kinds of buyers. If you do some advanced buyer persona work, you can make them separate buyer personas. And that would be pretty magical. You want to let me know so I can check out your accountant and um, sing its praises. But note what happens here. You just literally say matches. The other option is doesn't match or leave it alone. I don't know. If you say matches and back here to this thing, you set a full letter grade to roll and you said roll matches, it increases the letter grade by one in that automation rule. That one automation rule will increase the grade by one point. That's why we need a couple automation rules, looking at all the different fields and all the different criteria, upping the grade as you get the information. And it's, it'll continue. Sometimes when you send a lead over and then they give you more information, it'll update the grade after that. But ideally, you're asking some of these questions on the forms before it gets to sales. So by the time you're sending it to sales, they see column of A's with a bunch of numbers after it. Okay, remember that quiz at the beginning? Anyone want to get revenge on that first quiz? Help me out here. Which, which of these prospects do you call first? This is our second quiz. This is the last quiz. Who do you call first? Prospect A or prospect B? Look at that, Look at that amazing score on prospect A, guys. <laughs> hey, I love it. Thank you so much for, for throwing in the, uh, the Bs on chat. I think the Bs have it. Holy moly, no one's saying sarcastic A either. That, that must, have, um, must have worn you down, but that's, that's fantastic. B is it. Why? Because the grade says A. Now, I did a little backwards here. And I, what I like to do, and again, I've said this, sort first by grade, then by score. But I tried to do this to trick everyone, but naturally, I can't trick you at all. The 820 is fantastic engagement. That's how interested they are in, in us, but how interested are we in them? An F. By the way, I would never send that to sales. That would be part of the rule. You don't go over to sales. But this over here, okay, you're only a 60. It's not a huge score, but you're an A. So that means you're slightly engaged, but you're the right person. This happens a lot with CFOs. Do CFOs like filling out forms all the time and doing lead gen? And they can be not very friendly to that stuff. They can be hard. There can be people that are hard to track down and to get to fill out these things. <coughs> it's a blessing that he filled out one. So it's still, sales will be like, yum, give me that lead. I'm going to go after him. All right, a quick tack to the future. This is, I don't want to dwell too much here, but if you want to chit chat about it, let's totally do it. Quick caution when it comes to predictive analytics. We've got some cool stuff coming out with Salesforce. I didn't put it in this particular webinar because – then that would take you two hours past the total time. But um, there's some really cool stuff with predictive lead scoring. Um, but be careful of the content that you read. Be careful of what people are selling when they're making content for you. Because three reasons you should start using this thing. And oh, by the way, this thing sells this thing, right? A little shout out to Zoho with their crazy content. Just keep in mind, you know, a lot of times tech vendors will want you to use something. So they'll tell you it's the next best thing to slice bread. But what do we know about lead scoring right now? The name is a little, it's a little off, right? Because we know that lead scoring by itself is like garbage, right? It's just activities. But what we really want is the, the combination of lead scoring and grading. So would I be cool with predictive lead scoring and grading? Hell yeah, that would be cool. I would like to see that. But just by itself, lead scoring, even if it's predictive or not, or if it's psychic lead scoring, I don't really care. It just shows me how interested they are in me. And you know that 
yes, you can look at different people and say, well, these people are doing a lot of research and they led to sales. These people didn't. Students are going to throw off that data all the time. You're going to have to sort of separate that out. So just be careful with that data. Uh, predictive lead scoring. Um, quick thing on AI. It's actually augmented intelligence. Where it can be really good is helping spot patterns that you don't necessarily see because there's like too much data to look at. So when it comes to the AI coming down the path, and again, we'll do some highlights on the, on the tech, the part outs, doing some cool stuff with B2B marketing analytics. We have a whole webinar on that one too, if you're interested. Um, I like the idea of keeping in mind patterns can be really helpful in certain situations, right? So activity patterns can be hard. The multi-touch conundrum, they're still not as valuable as grading, but grading patterns, that should be discovered. That's the thing where we really need the help, right? When you ask sales and they're not really sure, or I've once had sales tell me they'll call everyone, but then they don't actually do that. We know that they don't do that. So we want to prioritize for them. We got to find out what are the ideal leads for them. If we don't know, we'll just use Bant. But consider the grading patterns. Consider doing some buyer persona research to find out what are the patterns in the grading. Even if sales doesn't know, let me talk to some buyers that love us and find out what are the different similarities that we can use. So whether you're using AI or not, consider the fact that grading is going to hold the most weight in these decisions. And scoring can be helpful, but not nearly as much as grading. And then both of them together, that's the Oreos and milk. Okay, quick resources and we'll get you on your way. First of all, get the book. Do you all have the book? I think we're going to send one copy to someone who had the awesome Glenn Gary uh, reference. I think that was Craig. Um, so make sure you send me an email, Casey at CheshireImpact.com with your address, Craig, and we'll get you a copy of that if that was you. But everyone else, hey, if you haven't, go check this thing out. I spent a couple couple, couple days writing this thing. No, a long time writing this thing. It's on Amazon right now. It's some great um, quarantine reading, if you will. Here's a, here's a picture of it. Well, boom, here's the book. And look, it, the thing, Amazon discounted. I don't even know why they did. We set it at $15. They discounted it to $10. I don't know what they're doing, um, but it's good for everyone because it gets it in their pocket, right? And we know how publishers get most money anyway, so we're good with that. But I want you to get this thing because it literally, um, it's everything I know. It's all these webinars combined into a book. If you prefer a book, instead of listening to me and my song and dance, but go check it out and let me know what you think. Love to see your thoughts. If you already have the thing, let me know. Give me some feedback. Casey at CheshireImpact.com. Uh, again, grab the book. Um, and it's got a rocket on the front. So that, that just makes me happy. Hey, a couple of the resources. Podcast. Does anyone listen to any of these podcasts? Have you heard them yet? If you have, throw it in the chat. Uh, by the way, a live reading of my book. I've A uh, book as a webinar. Um, yeah, I thought about that. I thought about doing a fundraiser for you know the people like nurses and doctors and their families and whatnot in like you know supporting the red cross or something where i did like a like a 10 hour live stream or something where all i did for a webinar was like read my book or like talk through it or something so <laughs> let me know if you would be interested in doing that but yeah yeah um sometimes people like listening to it instead of necessarily reading it so have you seen these podcasts yet do you Hey, thanks, Blair. You have the book. Own oh, just started this week. Awesome. Get me feedback on it. I would love to hear it. Um, and then a review on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> please and thank you. Audiobook would be good. Yeah, I agree. I would love to do an audiobook version of it. So part of life hacks. I kind of have like strategy level to um, middle middle weight in the in the weeds, right? Because I'm like trying to cover like no matter what tool you have or whatever you're doing, hit the strategy first then the process, then the technology. So strategy, process, a little bit of tech. I got a little bit of tech in these webinars. If you want more, if you want to geek out on Pardot to like the nth degree with, from someone who knows more about Pardot than even I do, and the technical aspects of B2B marketing analytics, Pardot Life Hacks is the, is the podcast to check out. Jennifer Snyder on our team is amazing, and she does this podcast. Sometimes they're quick little hit episodes like 10 minutes. Sometimes they're longer. She's done one on like the different objects, opportunity object, contact object, lead object, what you need to know about them, how to work with them, everything to B2B marketing analytics, connected campaign. Has anyone set up connected campaign? She has, a, she has an episode on there, which is like, don't set up connected campaigns until you've listened to this episode or the blog post she wrote tied to it. There's a whole series on connected campaigns and it gives context to like, there's, um, there's an implementation guide that Salesforce has, but then you're like, what does that even mean? She goes through click by click and talks why you should do this or not do that. 
or be careful with it. So I love her. I love her podcast. Check this thing out. Um, is it on Amazon podcast? No, it's not. I don't think it is. It's on everything else though, but I totally love that idea. I will definitely have us check on that. I, I don't I guess I didn't even realize they had that. Um, it's on Spotify. It's on Stitcher. It's on iTunes. Um, it's also on YouTube. So, um, both of these podcasts are on all those platforms, but yeah, we'll definitely look into Amazon podcasts. Finally, the hardcore marketing show. Has anyone heard that? Go check it out if it's your first podcast. That's my show. I interview really smart marketers. Um, not to say that we aren't all here, but like I interviewed, I once was like a, um, a Wharton school professor in marketing. And he just schooled me for like an hour and a half on using customer um, lifetime value in deciding the marketing strategies and how to deal. Oh, I'm just like blown away. So we got some really cool people. Matt Sweezy, um, one of the original Pardot guys, got him picking his brain, learning from him, um, Sangram from Terminus. So anyways, check those out. Those are fun. They're on YouTube as well as all those other platforms. Cool. We do that for you guys. It's not like we make any money on that. Those are just like, I love talking and connecting with marketers, learning their strategies. Also, in the book, there's little call-outs to podcasts. And when, whenever there's a, like an expert, because there, what we did is we got experts um, from different topics. Like Lauren Mead is amazing. Alignment through collaboration, right? So we call out to the podcast in the book. So it just, it's all kind of tied together. Oh, finally, one last thing on the book, not to beat the dead horse, but every single chapter ties into the CSI, that 10 step assessment that we have. Every single chapter in here, there's a chapter for each one of those segments, each one of those um, areas, A-B testing and optimization. The grading and scoring, the one we're doing right now has its own chapter in the book, right? So it's all kind of one big happy piece and puzzle. Hey, that's it. Um, resources, obviously we're here for you, Cheshire. Uh, it's tough times. We're all remote, so we're still cranking. So however we can help, me personally, send me an email, casey at cheshireimpact.com. Happy to help. Um, give you some guidance. Let me know if you need some help with the grading and scoring or any other questions we don't get to, we didn't get to because you had to bounce. Especially for those of you who had to bounce, you couldn't stay for the Q&A because I talked forever about a topic I love to talk about. Um, hit me up. Shoot me a note. Connect with me on Twitter. Love to hear from you. And finally, it is time. Wow. Um, it is time. Our, our window even closed because it's so happy to close. It's time for Q&A. So what do we have? Uh, does anyone have any questions? I'll go ahead and end the recording and then see if anyone has any questions. <laughs>